Yeah, so the title of this talk is Closed Script Has It All. Um, it's an expression that I would say to a really dear friend of mine um, when I moved into Closed Script back in 2021. Um, me and him, we were both colleagues before, and we'd both been working in TypeScript. And um, um, Give me one sec. I, I need my notes. <laughs> uh, does, does anyone know? I've never used Keynote before. Oh, hold on. All right, cool. Yeah, so uh, as I was saying, we have, both of us have been writing TypeScript for several years, and um, we both share a uh, passion for discovering and adopting new tools to improve our productivity and, and improve uh, sort of um, the quality of our work. Um, and I remember he used to hit me up regularly and ask me how my little adventure is going with uh, Closure Script. Um, I couldn't help but notice a little sort of skepticism in his tone. Um, that'll eventually sort of, you know, this interest or passion for closed script will die down uh, due to all the limitations. Maybe the, you know, the host interop isn't great or the, because of the tiny ecosystem, performance overhead and so on and so forth. Um, if none of that, you know, the language will go out of fashion and nobody would be hiring anymore. Um, that last point did cross my mind a few times. Um, but uh, you know the, the, the adoption is still not where we would like it to be. Um, but uh, it, it's still not non-existent. Uh, and I find myself incredibly lucky to um, to be able to sustain myself financially while also um, working in closed script. Uh, another reason why I find myself incredibly lucky is that I got into closed script um, after Shadow CLGS had. Uh, solved one of the, arguably one of the hairiest problems um, with closed script tooling, and that was uh, integration with the NPM ecosystem. Um, there have been several efforts in the past uh, to try to solve that, um, and the challenge has always been how to uh, pass NPM dependencies, node modules through Closure Compiler's advanced compilation um, without everything breaking. Uh, and the other being of uh, setting up externs. And I think Shadow CLGS takes a pretty reasonable approach there where um, all of your node modules go through a simple compilation step, uh, your application goes through an advanced compilation step, and uh, with auto um, sort of infern, so, sorry, extern inference, uh, you pretty much never really have to worry about um, externs either. So really it's just as simple as installing a dependency requiring it, um, just using string um, for the name of the library, and, and then just using it. Um, the situation is pretty good in terms of um, you know, other tool, uh, tooling that you typically need. Um, things like hot code reloading, code splitting, and all that. Um, so my friend would hear all of that, and um, uh, well, yeah, there's also, you know, uh, bindings with, so if you, I'm, I'm coming from a React background. Um, so if, you, if you're like me, you'll be well taken care of. There's tons of React binding libraries uh, that support modern React features like hooks, suspends, start transitions, so on and so forth. Um, there's some other modern React features that are unclear to me how closed script will or can support them, things like streaming with suspense. Uh, there's a, a whole other project that the React team is working on for several years, uh, which is React Compiler, um, which sort of modifies your handwritten code to, um, so that it can perform better at runtime. Um, and then yeah, other things like Tailwind that I've been using uh, work well, because it does a non-AST based static analysis, so that works. Um, uh, and yeah, with server and client rendering as well, uh, reader conditionals are pretty cool in the sense that um, 
the, the branch of your code that only renders on the server never makes it to the client. Um, so I think that's kind of neat. Um, so hearing all of this, my friend would say, you know, if, if that's what you wanted to do, if you just wanted to write React applications with all of the same tooling, essentially, um, why even bother, right? And uh, the answer to that is just one word, uh, and that is this. Uh, I feel like a lot of people that transition into ClojureScript from a JavaScript background uh, still underutilize REPL, uh, especially when working on UI applications. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they mostly just rely on the status quo, which is uh, hot code reloading and you know console logging and using profiler and stuff like that. Um, but uh, I think perhaps the reason for the underutilization of um, the REPL is that um, you know people are sort of stuck in the old sort of perspective of how to um, sort of build user interfaces. Uh, and I'd like to show a couple of demos for, uh, for where I have found REPL to be extremely useful to an extent that it's sort of become something that I'm using on a daily basis to, to create user interfaces. Um, so here we have a demo where uh, there's this problem that I had at work where we have these two columns and um, uh, the problem is that you need, a, you need to design an interface where you can drag and drop elements between these two columns um, and then also sort uh, those elements in those columns in, in whatever way just by using drag and drop. Um, so what I did to, to solve this problem was you know, look around in the React ecosystem, see if there's any libraries out there that implement this kind of an interface. I found one called DND Kit, and uh, that checked pretty much all the requirements, except um, that it didn't have like an um, sort of out of the box implementation for uh, managing multiple sort of sortable columns like like this. Uh, but it did provide a way to tap into the, under, the, the underlying collision logic, collision detection logic, so that you can create an algorithm that can determine, you know, as you're dropping an element where in either of the two columns, where it should go. Um, so in order to implement this, uh, what I did was, you know, I, I have this little function stub here. Um, the first thing that, that I did is look at the arguments that the library passes down, which is just a bunch of JavaScript data. Um, you know, the data gets logged in, in the console log, um, or in the uh, browser console, and uh, you know, you can uh, expand that data, look at it, and you can store it as a global variable in the uh, Chrome uh, run uh, in the Chrome runtime, and then if you have your code editor's environment connected to the running application, you can just reference that variable, right? And once you have that variable, which is the, the latest event that was um, uh, dispatched by the library, you can inspect that, right? You can sort of expand your sort of uh, code editor, you can forget about the browser, uh, you can start writing out logic for the algorithm, uh, you can evaluate that, and the data that you're still holding, um, you can pass that back into the function and, um, and see what it's doing, right? Um, and uh, you, know, you can iterate on that. And uh, you know, once, once you feel like you've gotten to a reasonable place, you can just go back to the application and just interact again, right? You, you, the, the things that you've evaluated, the things that you've tested are already available in the browser, which I think is amazing. Um, another quick demo, um, so in, in, in the application that I was working on, um, we're using Firebase, right? So Firebase has this sort of a, a reactive um, hooks where if something changes in the database or a new user gets created in the authentication, um, you can tie certain functions that get called against that. Um, so that's another example where I'm running um, Firebase emulator locally, 
Um, and I have this little function that I've tied to the event of user creation. And um, I can just, like, I, I want to have a similar workflow where I hold the data um, at, at hand and then sort of implement the, the functionality, right? So what I'm doing here is um, I'm using this library called snitch, which really what it does is it binds all the local variables in a function or let binding to the namespace scope. And once you have that, then um, you can, you know, do whatever you want to do in the outside world, right? And the data flows into the system. And once it does, you are holding the data in your REPL, right? Um, and you can inspect that. You can um, play around with the data. And then you can go ahead and sort of start building the implementation of the uh, the feature or the function that you uh, that you're working on. Um, <clears throat> a quick tip: if you ever find yourself working with Firebase emulators, um, Firebase has this uh, serverless functions thing, um, which, in the context of emulators in your local dev environment, uh, spawns these ephemeral Node.js processes um, that sort of die after a couple of minutes or so of inactivity. Um, and if you have a REPL connected to one of those Node.js runtimes, then the connection is going to uh, drop, and then you're no, no longer going to be able to evaluate stuff in your code editor. Um, so a quick tip is what you can do is you can um, uh, run and own your own Node.js process uh, just by you know, doing node index to index being the, the compiled output. Um, that Firebase functions uh, take. And then you can use, so in, in, in this case, I'm using um, um, Shadow CLJS's uh, um, API to inspect all the runtimes that are running at any given time, and then um, pick the one that I have created myself and the one that I'm managing, and then that can ensure that you know, the, the process never gets killed and my REPL connection stays. Another interesting thing that I um, came across in this journey was um, sort of use of macros in really interesting ways. So I've, you know, in the past few uh, gigs that I've been working at, I've been extensively using Storybook, um, and I wanted to use Storybook in my closure, closed script setup as well. Um, essentially, what Storybook does is that it, that it um, recursively walks your project directory and identifies certain modules that it identifies as stories, and then it loads them up and uh, in a way that on a, on a, um, on a storybook hosted page, um, it lists down all of those components on the left-hand side, and then you can um, click on those and inspect those elements uh, or, or those components in isolation. Uh, it does a lot more. Uh, there's tons of add-ons that Storybook has as well, but that's the, the core use case that I had. Um, so instead of figuring out how to integrate Storybook with my closure, closure script setup, uh, since I only needed an isolated library of components with a, you know, a, a listing on, on the, in the sidebar, um, I ended up just writing a, a macro, which I think is another really cool thing uh, about closure script. Um, it's, it's, it's not something like writing a compiler plugin is not something that um, I've ever dared to do in the JavaScript world. Uh, but in Clojure and ClojureScript, uh, since you're already familiar with all the APIs for dealing with data, with lists, and so on and so forth, uh, the, the hurdle to climb is, is not uh, much at all. Um, so yeah, this is an example of a small macro uh, essentially, what it does is it, it, it gives you a way to, wherever you are in your code base, to uh, register a component to show up in, these, in this uh, isolated dev environment. Um, and you can pass down a React component uh, or any sort of, um, uh, sort of hiccup uh, markup. Uh, and it creates a, uh, a representation for that. Uh, and then it registers that in a global sort of registry that we're keeping that, they can, that then gets used to render the sidebar with all of the components listed, and then you can click on them, and you can 
uh, have your component rendered in that isolated environment. Uh, without macros, this would have been an entire project, you know, writing compiler plugins with Babel or whatever. Uh, so different skill set, API to learn. Um, and in small teams, like the, I've, I've mostly worked at startups, and in small teams, you know, stuff like that never really gets done if your team is focused on shipping, right? Because you know, it's a lot of it's a it's a big time commitment. Um, another cool sort of use case potentially for macros is this thing that I talked about earlier, React Compiler. Um, it sort of rewrites and modifies the code that you've written for your components to um, automatically do some, some memoization and other uh, improvements that will have a runtime performance improvement. Um, I haven't really seen anyone taking a stab at this just yet, but I found uh, Helix, which is a closure binding library, uh, sorry, React binding library, um, this uh, experimental feature called auto depths, which automatically uh, uh, creates the dependency array for if you're using React use effect hook uh, without you needing to specify that yourself. And that's a pretty cool use case of macros. And I believe you know, there can be other interesting things that we can do. Uh, using macros where, you know, in the JavaScript world, you have to write compiler stuff, um, which, you know, technically macros are still compiler stuff, but it's a lot more within reach. Um, so, yeah, really, uh, you know, working in closed script uh, is, is fine. Uh, all of the basic stuff has been taken care of. Um, I can only imagine how difficult it would be without uh, Shadow CLJS's support for node modules uh, and NPM libraries. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the ecosystem is, is great. There's great commitment to key projects. Um, there's new stuff popping up um, you know, every so often as well. Uh, but really the main reason I believe anyone should uh, consider closed script uh, is, is the REPL and macros. Um, yeah. The only thing that I miss from TypeScript is, is not having static typing, but we don't talk about that here. All right, so that's my talk. Thank you.